Bitte? Gut. سامعني كويس يا استاذه سامر ايوه يا دكتور ان شاء الله دقيقه واحده وهنبدا انا بتاكد بس ان الصوت واصل كويس مش محتاج ان انا اقرب من المايك لا لا تمام كان يو سي ذا بارتيسيبنت 489 ما شاء الله وان شاء الله يا رب الزياده كمان See if how can I see the text? So once I will touch this one, it will bring me the uh, which text you want to see? The text from the participants chat. Question here 19 question and answer. Yeah, but so I can you the click. I can open the bar on the but they have stopped. Sharing. No, not that because it will stop sharing. It will stop sharing. So yeah. I, I can't see the question and the answer while I'm presenting. Yeah. I can't. Mm -hmm. So when I will see them at the end? Later on, maybe objected. Uh... Can you hear, uh, Tamir? I wait, doctor. <laughs> I can't see the question and the answer while I'm presenting. It is with the host, I think. Did you hear that? Yes, doctor. I think we can start now. So if I have question, how can I answer them? I can't after see After the it. presentation. After At the, the end? Presentation. Okay, thank yeah. you. I think uh, you can start the presentation now. Uh, we are on live. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Tamer Ahmed, Academic Affairs Department. Uh, before we get started, if you have any question during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom. Our talk today will be about chronic pelvic pain. Our speaker, Dr. Ayman Zaglul, consultant and the head of Begaini SGH Riyadh. Dr. Ayman worked in UK for 24 years. Last 12 years, he was consultant, urogynecology and the minimal access surgery. Brighton. Sussex University Hospital. Please, Dr. Ayman, you can start. Assalamu alaikum, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Mr. Tamer, and I would like to thank Saudi German Hospital Riyadh for giving me this opportunity to talk to my colleagues about such important topic, which is chronic pelvic pain. My colleagues, you might be surprised uh, why I'm sitting and Mayo Clinic is behind me. Actually, I am not in uh, USA, but here I am in uh, Saudi German Hospital Riyadh. Uh, we are proud that we are we have a link with uh, Mayo Clinic, which helps the uh, all the doctors in the hostel to be up to date and also help the patients to get the best up-to-date care. If we are unsure of any management, we can do e-consultation with the team there, and we can have uh, like multidisciplinary team, if you would like to say. So that's why we are proud and of the Mayo Clinic partnership, and we are putting it everywhere. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, chronic pelvic pain, and
the uh, first one. I'm sorry, there is a technical difficulty. Yes. So uh, I was working, as Mr. Tamer said, which I'm grateful for him to prepare all this work and webinar. So I was working in uh, this hospital. And as you can see, this is Brighton and Sussex University Hospital. This building, this building, this building. And this is the old Brighton and Sussex University Hospital. I was working there. As you can see, it is have a very beautiful sea view, uh, seafront view. And I worked there for 12 years. When I was working there, as you know, the general gynae referral, chronic pelvic pain constitute 30% of all the referrals we see in Brighton and Sussex University Hospital and the same for any other hospital in UK. And I can tell you 50% of these referrals will be about uh, irritable bowel syndrome or bowel in origin. And 30% of the total number of the referred to us will be endometriosis. When I moved to sunny Riyadh, and this is the sunrise, beautiful sunrise in Riyadh, I can't imagine. And I can tell you, this is the road. On the left, it was the beautiful sunrise, and I was in the middle of the Arabic months. And if you look to the right side, you can see the moon coming down, beautiful view. And now I am working in Saudi German hospital with a stylish building. And there is no much difference in the percentage or prevalence of the pelvic pain I was seeing in UK. And now I am seeing in Riyadh. And the proof of that, the study which has been done by Dr. Cindy, and he showed that the prevalence of the pelvic pain in the cases referred to, to him, and he did laparoscopy was 50%. And the prevalence of, prevalence of endometriosis of them was about 14%. So whatever the place we are working in, in UK, in USA, in Saudi Arabia, chronic pelvic pain, is still a problem for us. And I think this uh, photo is quite descriptive about the agony this woman is suffering from. So chronic pelvic pain is a pain which occurs below the umbilicus and lasts at least three, uh, six months. It could be intermittent, it could be constant, not cyclical, however, most of the study is still considering cyclic pelvic, pelvic pain, i.e. this menorrhea, is part of the chronic pelvic pain. And the prevalence of the chronic pelvic pain is between 6 to 27%. So what are the implications of chronic pelvic pain? It, disturb, it disturbs the physical, mental health, and the sleep quality of the ladies being affected, up to 32% of them would be affected. It has economic aspect because the woman will have repeated absence from the work between 13 to 32% of them. Decrease fertility between 45 and 64%, which cost about $65 billion loads of money. Other economic aspect, including that the woman decreasing the ability, decreasing her ability to be a proper mom and the proper wife because of the agony she's in all the time. When we are talking about the chronic pelvic pain, we have to bring the this section of sagittal section of the pelvis in front of us when we are having a patient in the clinic and we are thinking about the differential diagnosis of chronic pelvic pain, we have to look at this picture, which have all the anatomical structures 
in the pelvis, which can lead to chronic pelvic pain. And definitely we can have endometriosis or adenomyosis. We can have adhesion, especially if this woman had previous uh, surgery, fibroid uterus, chronic pelvic inflammatory disease like gonorrhea or chlamydia, which fortunately we don't have a lot of them in Saudi Arabia or the Middle East. But for example, in States and in UK, we have a, a genitourinary clinic specifically for such complaint. Pelvic, conge pelvic congestion syndrome, valvodynia, painful bladder syndrome, or the old name interstitial cystitis, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis, pelvic support problem, fibromyalgia, and at the end, psychological causes. So when we assess a woman for chronic pelvic pain, APC, we have to take history. And please, 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 when we take history from a woman coming with chronic pelvic pain, we need to be patient, open, empathetic. And always we start with open question, which is, for example, how can I help you? Tell me, what is the problem? And we listen to her. It's very important. Give your ears, two ears, to the woman, okay, for not less than three minutes. If she exceeded three minutes, diplomatically, you can start to direct the question. But please leave her to talk. Leave her to empty her chest. And then the examination. Abdo general examination and abdominal examination. And if she pointed toward joint or whatever, at least you know where you are going to do your differential diagnosis. Investigation for chronic pelvic pain, if there is vaginal discharge, history of uh, unprotected sex, we can do screening for infection, gonorrhea, chlamydia. We can do transvaginal ultrasound, or if she's virgin, we can do pelvic ultrasound, MRI, and this is in tertiary center, especially if the, if the ultrasound was not useful, or if the ultrasound raised the suspicion of endometriosis, for example, in the rectovaginal septum. Diagnostic laparoscopy is the golden method for investigation of endometriosis, especially if it is not in the form of endometrioma, i.e. chocolate cyst. CA125, and some of you will say, or is going to tell me why you are doing CA125. Because ovarian cancer can only present initially with bowel symptoms, lower abdominal discomfort, ballooning loss of appetite. And if we have such symptoms, it is much easier to do CA125. And if it is quite high, it gives us impression that it might be ovarian cancer. Definitely cystoscopy, if we suspect uh, uh, interstitial cystitis or colonoscopy, uh, or colonoscopy, if she has bowel symptoms, and this definitely will be in tertiary center. So now we'll start to talk about endometriosis because I will focus in, uh, in my talk about endometriosis and interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome. And endometriosis is common, yes, it's common. Poorly understood, yes, because we have many theories to explain the pathogenesis of endometriosis and it can strike woman of any socioeconomic class, age, or race. It affected between 10 to 20% of American women. And in Saudi Arabia here, the prevalence of endometriosis in the study which had been done by Dr. Samir Sindhi was 14.3%. And the pelvic pain was presented in 55.3% of the cases he has seen or he has done laparoscopy for, and infertility presented in 30% of them. 
This is not the problem. The problem that the time gap between the symptoms and the diagnosis of endometriosis is usually long, leaving the woman in agony. And the more you leave the woman with endometriosis, the more the problem will get worse and the effect on her fertility will get worse as well. So for example, the time gap uh, between the beginning of symptoms and diagnosis in Norwegian women was six uh, years plus, while in Anglo-American was three to 11 years. Pathophysiology of endometriosis, the most acceptable theory, retrograde menstruation, and uh, which means that some of the uh, menstrual blood will go back through the tubes to the peritoneal cavity. And although it is the most ac uh, accessible, uh, acceptable and old theory, but it doesn't explain the remote uh, places we can find the endometriosis in, like, for example, the muscle of the uterus or in the lung, for example. So autoimmune disease, autoimmune disease theory can explain some of them. Genetic can explain some of them. And that's why when we say genetic, we can find that uh, it runs in family. So when you have grandma and mother having endometriosis, most likely their daughter will have endometriosis as well. And mullerianosis, which means that the cells with the potential to become endometrial cells are let down in the tracks during the embryology life and then dislodged while after the uterus is moved down and stay there to be endometriosis. Or the silomic metaplasia theory, and which say that the silomic epithelium has the potential to produce the endometrial cell and the other peritoneal cell. So if metaplasia due to chronic inflammation, for example, happen in the peritoneal cells, this can change it to endometrial cells. So what is the histology of the endometriosis? So when we examine endometriosis under the microscope, we can see stroma, epithelium, and the gland. And if it is old endometriosis, you will find uh, hemocytrin as brown color. So the classification now of endometriosis will be according to the modified American Society of Reproductive Medicine. They divide it into four stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And the stage one, which is very superficial lesion, and you might have filmy adhesion. While in stage two, the lesions start to be deeper in the cul-de-sac. Stage three, as above, with the presence of endometrioma and more adhesion. While in the final stage, stage four, you have large endometrioma and extensive adhesion. And this is one which you can just demonstrate here, the just tiny endometriosis. And this one, you can have deeper stage two and just filmy adhesion. While stage three is endometrioma, but there is no adhesion, as you can see. If there is extensive adhesion, I will classify this one as a stage four. So diagnosis of endometriosis, as we agreed before, history and the examination. We'll do ultrasound or MRI. Ultrasound initially has a very characteristic picture, which is ground glass appearance. We need to do only MRI if there is suspicion of the nodule in the rectovaginal septum, because this will need uh, extensive surgery in combination between the gynecologist and the colorectal surgeon to do anterior resection. And as we agreed, laparoscopy is the gold standard method for investigation or diagnosis of the endometriosis. And also it will be the best method to remove endometrioma or treat the endometriosis as we will see. So 
If we have endometriosis we diagnose, the treatment will depend on the size and type and the stage of endometriosis. So we can give, if it is mild, we can, or stage one, two, we can give progestogen, which inhibits the growth of the endometrium, oral contraception, which reduces the menstrual pain associated with endometriosis, danazole, suppressive steroids, but we don't like it because of the androgenic effect of it, uh, GNRH -R -R -H, G -N -R -H analog, which actually down regulate the pituitary and subsequently uh, induce menopausal symptoms and that's what, and reduce the, uh, inhibit the endometriosis. The side effect of it is the uh, menopausal symptoms and with add back therapy, it should be fine. Non-hormonal treatment, something like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So this is a medical treatment we can give either hormonal or non-hormonal. Then, what about the surgical treatment? If there is, if I am doing laparoscopy and there is endometriosis, okay, it is better to treat. And then if you would like to give any medical hormonal or non-hormonal, you can give. So we can do laparoscopic diathermy of endometriosis, laparoscopic resection of endometriosis, laparoscopic adhesolysis, pre-sacral neurectomy. No one is doing it, to be honest. And Luna, there is no evidence that this one or pre-sacral neurectomy is helpful anymore. Hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, if no other option of the treatment and the woman is completing her family, if there is nodule in the rectovaginal septum, we'll do anterior resection, but actually the recurrence is still high, 10%. So good counseling to the woman need to be done. In vitro fertilization, the decision when to apply IVF in endometriosis associated with infertility, it depends. Depends on the age of the patient, depends on the severity, the stage of endometriosis, and the presence of other infertility factor, male factor, for example, and the result and the duration of the previous treatment. So we, we have to have a holistic approach when we are thinking about fertility, and sooner rather than later, uh, maybe IVF is a better option for her. So if we are talking about the endometrioma, I, I can tell you that the largest endometrioma ever in the world was reported in Japan in 1997. And the size of this endometrioma was 25 by 18 by 12 centimeters. And they drained 2.5 liter of chocolate brown material. And in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, this was our endometrioma. And the size of this endometrioma, which is currently, currently the largest endometrioma ever in the world, was 27 by 22 centimeters and was done laparoscopically by me and my team in 2018 in Riyadh. And this is 10 liters of chocolate brown material being sucked from the cyst before removing this ovary laparoscopically. And this is the team I can have. This is me, Ayman, here in the middle. And this is Faiza, who is currently consultant in uh, one of the big private hospital. And the same Azza is one of the uh, consultant, very popular in, the, in her private hospital as well. I don't want to mention names. And Radi is the uh, clever anesthetist who uh, give anesthesia for this patient. And the patient is really grateful that we have done her operation laparoscopically. I finished the endometrioma and I will move quickly to the uh, pelvic pain syndrome or painful bladder syndrome or the old name interstitial cystitis. Uh, and I can tell you that the definition of interstitial cystitis or uh, bladder pain syndrome is continuous or intermittent suprabiobic pain, urethral pain related to the bladder filling. So just the key here is the woman will tell you, once I have a full bladder, it is so painful. And once she passed urine or micturate, she will do like that. This is exactly what the woman will say in the clinic. 
And the prevalence of it is about uh, 6% in USA. And I couldn't find any prevalence to it in Saudi Arabia. There, with interstitial cystitis, there is increased frequency, urgency, nocturia, but there is absence of urinary infection. When you do urine debistic, there is one plus RBC, one plus leukocyte, and negative MSU. Theories, hyperpermeability, there is a layer called gag layer or glycoaminoglycan. This layer is painting the bladder from inside and prevent the potassium in the urine from irritating the nerve ending in the wall of the bladder. If, the, if, the, if defect happen in this layer, this can irritate the bladder, or it is autoimmune, infection, allergic, genetic stress. And when we have many theory, I promise you, we don't know the exact cause. And here is the, glyca the gag layer, as you can see, and if there is any defect, the potassium will, like this one, the potassium will uh, go and irritate the nerve ending, and we might have uh, during the uh, cystoscopy, we can see the glomerulation, and I will show it to you in another photo. And this is the Han Hunter ulcer, which is the um, um, actually uh, need uh, laser vulgaration, okay, because this is really painful. With the interstitial cystitis or chronic pelvic uh, or painful uh, bladder syndrome, we can see seven associated conditions, depression and anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, indigestion, migraine, vulvodynia, systemic autoimmune disease, skin problem like allergy or eczema. This can explain the autoimmune, the psychological factor, whatever, okay? So it will be like a package, I'm afraid. Laboratory test for interstitial cystitis, urine debistic, MSU, urine cytology, to especially if we have it by age of 50 or more than 45, we need to do cytology to rule out any uh, malignancy. And investigation, we can do urodynamic test and we can see uh, in the urodynamic test, increase a filling sensation, low bladder capacity and low Q max. And if we do uh, pelvic ultrasound, unlikely to see anything, but on cystoscopy, when we fill the bladder, we can, and we start to empty the bladder gradually, we can see this uh, bleeding spots, which we call it glomerulation. In the past, it was initial, uh, essential to take four, at least four biopsies and send it for histology to see and to diagnose interstitial cystitis, we, we have to see more than 28 mast cells per millimeters, but nowadays it is not essential to diagnose it, okay? Clinical picture and cystoscopy is more than enough. Management, according to the American Urological Association, first line of treatment, patient education and self-care, diet modification. This is the cornerstone of the treatment. Second, oral medication, imitriptyline to numb the nerve ending, gabapentine, and cystostat to enhance the gag layer. Third line of treatment of if there is HANAR ulcer is to do laser vulgaration, and this will be done by the urology colleague. Fourth line of treatment, neuromodulation, on, and fifth will be botulinum toxin. And finally, if it is refractory to all of the above, we need to do urinary diversion to stop the agony of this woman or augmentation cystoplasty. Non-specific treatment, anticholinergic, anti-inflammatory, analgesics, okay, just to relieve pain. So as we said, the cornerstone of the treatment will be diet modification. Food, drink containing caffeine should be stopped. Citrus fluid, juice, lemon, vinegar, artificial sweetener, alcohol, wine, soda, carbonated drinks, even fizzy water shouldn't get high spiced food. And at the end, please keep safe because no one is immune from Corona, even Trump got it.
and let her let him have Clorex ID. Thank you so much, guys. Any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Ayman. Uh, I want to announce about the certificate. It will be sent by email after three days to everyone. Regarding the CME hours, you have to attend the 10 lectures. After that, you will get 10 CME hours free of charge. Our lectures, it will be every Saturday evening, nine o'clock at the same day. My mobile number mentioned in the poster, you can take it 0502-466-292. You can communicate with me every week. I can send you the poster for the coming lecture and the link. After you will complete uh, 10 lectures, you will get 10 CME hours. Thank you so much. Uh, see you soon, inshallah, in the next webinar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.